Here we are, back together again. Hello, carefree cooks everywhere. It's Chef Todd. I just made some cornbread. Check that out. <laughs> okay, oh, something about cornbread. I make a lot of cornbread in the fall. Um, I guess because it goes so well with like the chilies and the stews. I always like that. And I, it's cold <laughs> by now. It's cooled off. But one day I'm going to have to show you my cool parchment paper cutting trick so it falls right out of the pan today. But uh, that's really not what I came to talk to you about. It's not why I alerted you on our alert system that I was about to go live. Uh, the reason that I'm really glad that we're <laughs> together again is because we get another opportunity to explore the hows and whys behind cooking. And I want to be here to support you through this upcoming fall and holiday cooking season because this can be one of the toughest times of the year and I want to be here for you so we can go through that because we all know that family is descending upon you right they're going to be banging on the doors arriving they want food and lately uh, we've been talking about how your cooking should change with the seasons because we've gone over this yes summer cooking is cool but it's different than fall cooking because in the fall you use different foods uh, you use different methods you even use different effects of heat on food and the four effects of heat on food can affect your seasonal cooking in more ways than you might think. I, I used to teach this class uh, years ago in my cooking school, and yeah, I got started thinking about what we were going to do today, what I wanted to talk about, and how my cooking was being affected with the F effects of all right it's not <laughs> it's not an english lesson but this is a class i used to teach many years ago and unless you were one of those original 16 people in the class back then more than a decade ago you probably have never heard of this concept before and the concept is a little bit more advanced okay i, I had this discussion with somebody today in my building and, and they said uh, oh well you know your audience your group of people they they want quick and easy recipes right? No. I was like, oh my goodness, she said the dirty word, you know? But no, no, no. I, I said our audience wants to know the hows and whys. Our audience is curious. Our audience wants to delve a little deeper into just microwaving some chicken nuggets. So this whole idea that using different effects of heat on food that it can affect your cooking is really a high level kind of thing. So let's start with a quick review, should we? This is something that every web cooking classes member should know and should know by heart. It's something I test my culinary college students on over and over and over again. This is the biggest difference between web cooking classes and what everybody else teaches. It's the four effects of heat on on food and how it can affect your cooking. We'll go through them very quickly. You should know them already. At 150 degrees Fahrenheit or about 65 Celsius, gelatinization of starches. Starches absorb liquid and they swell. At 165 or 74, coagulation of proteins proteins stiffen and shrink. At 212 or 100, evaporation of moisture. Moisture turns to steam, it goes up into the atmosphere. And at 320 or 160, caramelization of sugars. This is when the sugars in an item get crispy and crunchy and dark, like the grill marks in the summer, or toasty things are like toast. So stay with me here for a minute, because just as summer is the opposite of winter, and spring is the opposite of fall, so are the two extremes in our temperatures here. They're seasonal cooking. It's inherently so. So I want you to think about this for a minute. Gelatinization of starches and caramelization of sugars are really opposite effects, like spring and fall are opposite. In the spring and the summer, you use a lot of caramelization of sugars. You know, you want to talk chef talk? <laughs> Today, we're gonna, I told you, this is going to be a little higher level. It, so in spring and summer, you're really focusing on that caramelization of sugars a lot more. You're, you're grilling at this time of year, right? You're, you're getting those nice grill marks on your chicken, your, your burger, your portobello mushroom cap if you're a vegetarian. Uh, but this is the point of grilling is to burn stuff, right? And if you're totally honest with yourself, you know that the terrible truth about grilling is finds in the spring and the summer. This is when it happens. And the truth is that burning things in nice weather is allowed. 
Oh, come on. <laughs> you know it's true. If you pulled a chicken breast out of your oven indoors and it was black and charred, you say it was a terrible fail and you would throw it away. But if you burn some chicken skin on the barbecue grill, well, then it's nicely blackened. You know it. Caramelization of sugars, caramelizing stuff, burning stuff, is the food effect of warm weather. But once fall starts turning into winter, the cooking comes indoors, right? And when you think about fall cooking, you immediately think about the stews, the soups, the dark sauces, the roasted meats, the casseroles, these things that go in the oven. Fall and winter most often mean moist cooking. Think about this, okay? I know I'm getting to you with this. Dry, conductive, caramelizing in the summer, moist, convective, slurp it up with a spoon, you know, stick to your ribs, all the cliche type of cooking. These are the things that warm you from the inside when the weather gets cold. Moist cooking though, getting to the point, always calls for a thickening agent. If you're gonna cook in moisture, you, you need to thicken it at some point. And the, the, a thickening agent is what makes those stews, those soups, those sauces, it, what, it's what makes them stick to your ribs or stick to a spoon or whatever we're, st whatever we're sticking to these days. And my point here is, is that fall and winter use more gelatinization of starches then caramelization of sugars. If you cook by the four effects of heat on food, which you should be doing, then you're switching effects for the season. And you already know the things don't brown in moist cooking. Moisture kills caramelization of sugars. But you can thicken things really nicely in moist cooking that you don't do on the barbecue grill. Nothing gets thicker on the barbecue grill. And it's one of the things that really makes fall cooking so cozy to me. And that's really what I came to talk about today. The thickening agents that you can use for fall soups, sauces, gravies, casseroles, stews, all the stuff that you're gonna be cooking in the new season. And really there are three ways to thicken a liquid. And the first one I just touched on, it's a starch. And that's why gelatinization of starches is the effect of heat on food that is most effective this time of the year. Wink, wink, hey, I'm, pre I'm pretty sharp <laughs> with the wordplay, aren't I? We've talked about keeping the dark roux cubes in your freezer. I did that in an episode a few weeks ago. There's a few episodes on that. And roux is the most used thickening agent because of its effectiveness. And it's also got that butter, you know, mouth feel. And it should not be starchy when it's made well. The next thing I want you to think about is grandma's house at Thanksgiving whether it's a Canadian Thanksgiving or a U.S. Thanksgiving, did grandma always thicken those turkey drippings with a cornstarch slurry? Yeah, most people did. Mix up the slurry with some water, pour it in there, and then suddenly you got gravy. And it's another good use of the gelatinization of starches. But if you're gluten intolerant, if you've got a gluten intolerance, rice starches, potato starches, they're also excellent thickening agents for those types of diets. You know, think about this. If I were going to make like a cream of potato soup or a Vichy Soi soup, I would use potato starch as a thickener. What, what's the sense of using butter and flour in a potato soup when potato will thicken it just perfectly, right? You can simmer dry rice in a liquid and this will thicken the liquid and cook the rice as well. You can simmer dry beans in a liquid for the same effect. And these are all starches that will thicken a liquid beginning at 150 degrees Fahrenheit or 64 Celsius. They, it doesn't always have to be flour and butter to make a roux to thicken something. So start thinking about new thickening agents for fall. So as I told you, this, as spring is to fall, so is caramelization of sugars to gelatinization of starches. They're opposites. They're like totally different times of the year, but Let's not stop today's lesson there. Like, let's go even further because starches aren't the only way to thicken a liquid. And if you're with me, you know that fall cooking gets really cozy when your soups, your stews, your sauces, they get darker, they get thicker. And the next way to thicken a liquid is simply by adding something that's thicker than what you already have. This couldn't be simpler. 
You don't need any cooking skills to mix one thing into the other. Anyone can thicken a soup, a stew, a sauce with this technique. So here's some things to try. Tomato paste. Tomato paste is a great thickener for stews and sauces because it also gives you that like acidic quality. You know, it's, a, it's always a contrast with the earthiness of your stew or your sauce. Uh, use smooth melting cheeses. I go to goat cheese all the time in my white sauces because it melts so well, it gives you that tangy contrast. Again, brie works really well, uh, fontina cheese, a uh, baby Swiss, gouda, soft cheddars, even American cheese works well, but we're, we're not going to mention Velveeta here. It's, it's a food group of its own, no Velveeta. Uh, you can use yogurt as a thickening agent. They do that in a lot of Eastern European countries, cooking in cereal grains, uh, using that as a thickening agent. Things like couscous, farina, oatmeal, barley, they can add texture to any soup, any stew, any sauce. It can even, you can even cook it and then strain it out of the liquid and then go ahead and serve it as a side dish and you have the thickened liquid. Uh, egg yolks, also great thickening liquid for custards, uh, for classical tempered sauces. If you think about hollandaise sauce, think about what the egg yolk does to clarified butter. It thickens it. Egg yolks, uh, they're emulsifiers. They bring two unmixable items together. They thicken salad dressings. They make mayonnaises, aioli, things like that. So that's my point today, because I'm thinking about thicker sauces for fall, and there's a lot more to making your fall cooking thicker than just using the gelatinization of starches. Because the third way to thicken any liquid is with a puree. Any liquid can be thickened with something else that's been pureed. Think about a pea soup, pureed peas, right? And one of my favorite techniques is using pureed black beans or lentils to thicken soups and sauces. And you can use this puree method to thicken liquids in any combination of the things that I just mentioned, right? Pureed cooked rice is gonna give you a thicker soup than rice just floating around in, in a broth-based soup. Pureed oatmeal, pureed barley, mashed potatoes, whipped up potatoes, pureed corn, pureed carrots, celery, radishes, butternut squash. <laughs> that almost sounds like baby food, right? And you are right. Baby food. Baby food is an excellent thickening agent to keep the nutrition and flavor of your dish. I could go on <laughs> for hours with this. And, you know, there's actually a story behind that that I don't have a lot of time to tell you. But it, it was a story when I was executive chef at, the lar at a large hospital. Uh, we have a dysphagia diet of uh, people that have trouble swallowing. Actually, people have trouble keeping things down. And thickening is so important for this type of diet. We went through so many incarnations of the best ingredients to use and ultimately it came down to baby food thickened like steamed broccoli or rices that we did for them. It's really, it's a crazy thickening agent. I'll tell you that whole story another time. But what I want you to do today is to, to look around your kitchen. I want you to look for the ingredients and flavors that are going to say fall to your family and start making those things the seasonal changes to your cooking right now before it's too late. Because fall cooking is really cozy when it starts coming indoors, right? When you, when you got to cover up the barbecue grill, when you have to start making those dark, thick soups, the stews, the gravies, the casseroles, all that kind of stuff. Because when you do, give a little more thought to the most important effect of your fall cooking this year. And that's your ability to thicken a liquid because it deserves even more attention. And this is going to affect everyone at your dinner table, and that is going to make you proud of what you've done. And if you want to go even deeper into this topic, even darker, even thicker into how you can change your cooking for fall, I've just relaunched my new class. It's three surprising ways to enrich your fall cooking that you might be missing. And I only held this class for one week, it was about a month ago, but people were like clamoring. It was so popular that I knew I had to bring it back. And you can find a class time that's right for you when you hold your spot. I would do it right away because we're just launching this and before these spots are gone, go to webcookingclasses.com slash cozy. Uh, you know, I don't know how many days I'm, I'm going to ex extend the class deadline. So if you want to do it, now is the time to register. I'd go check it out. Webcookingclasses.com slash cozy to hold your spot. And you might even figure out, if you stay to the end, how you can get a shirt like this for free. As long as we have more. As long as we have enough. But uh, we should. 
This is Chef Todd Moore. I'm reminding you uh, that there is a thickening method <laughs> to your fall cooking success. I hope to see you in the new fall class, and I hope to see your darker, richer, deeper gravies and stews because it's fall time and uh, the salmon on the grill is gone. <laughs> we'll talk soon. See you Tuesday for the Carefree Cooks Code. Bye-bye, everyone.